down inferential statistics. statistics. This basically means that I measure a small group and get information about a much larger group. So, for example, this here is my total population of things. And this here is a sample that I use. Just to give you an example for that, how many of you have watched Coronation Street last night? Hands up. Nobody did. That's quite interesting because obviously, <laughs> okay, how many of you um, how many of you have heard about inferential statistics? Okay, hands up. Okay, one, that's about 20 people. Yeah, 20 people. It's about 100 people, I would say, roughly, 100 people here. So I can say 20% have heard about inferential statistics. Now, I want to know how many people in the UK have heard about inferential statistics. Of course, I can't ask everybody in the UK. It's, uh, how, many, how many people uh, live in the UK? 60, yes, let's do it 60 million or something like that. So I can't all ask all 60 million. That would take me forever. But, assuming that you are a representative cross-section from the population in the UK, I can say about 20% of the citizens in the UK have heard about inferential statistics. So, basically, I go from taking a sample and make a conclusion, make an inference about the population. That is what inferential statistics is all about. And you have got experience with that. Because every time there is an election, people do exactly like that. The pollsters. They do exactly this thing. They ask a few people, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 people, what are you going to vote? Are you voting Tory? Are you going to vote Labour? Are you going to vote Lib Dem, the Greens, the uh, cult of the flying spaghetti monster? Uh, you know, all these things. And from this small sample, they try to make inference about what is the population going to vote. This is inferential statistics. And just to uh, introduce a little bit of terminology, we've discussed populations and samples already when we discussed uh, the standard deviation, didn't we? And there are slightly different ways of calculating the standard deviation. Um, for example, with the standard deviation for a sample, you divide by n minus 1, the standard deviation of a population, you just simply divide by n, as you should have done in your assessed practical. Just a little bit of terminology. A population is characterized by its parameters. A sample is characterized by its statistics. So when I, when I speak about a statistics, you should immediately 
realize that this is a sample. When I talk about parameters, you should be aware that this is now a population. And luckily, it works quite well as a memnonic population parameters sample statistics. So that's quite handy. We said in a sample, which is characterized by the statistics, we have a mean, which is usually denoted by X bar, and we have a standard deviation, which is usually denoted by an S. And the uh, standard deviation is N minus 1, where you divide that. A population is characterized by a mean, but in order to... Um, indicate that we are now dealing with a mean, this mean is abbreviated with the Greek letter mu. So that's the mean. And the standard deviation of the population is abbreviated with Greek sigma. So this, in a way, helps people already to to realize that there are, these are two different things. What we very often do is we calculate the mean of a sample and then say, right, we believe, or we have good reason to assume that this mean of the sample represents also the mean of the population. That is what all pollsters, all questionnaires, etc., is based on. If I want to measure the height, if I want to know the height of all males in the UK, I take a sample, I measure folks, I get a mean for that, and then I say, right, I believe that this mean represents all males, the height of all males in the UK. This is a pretty simple concept, just makes life easier, but we need to be aware that obviously there are some errors involved. So that's sort of an introduction to inferential statistics, and I will come back to the errors when we discuss what is called hypothesis testing. So far, pretty straightforward, I guess. Now, what can we do with that? For example, we can look at specific, what is called, distributions. distributions of data. Just to give you an example, what I mean by that, I had a look at your assessed practical, and about what you gave me in terms of results for your protein, unknown protein concentration. And what I found was, so here are the milligram per milliliter for, I think, group A or so. And here I can plot how many people gave me that value. So this is also called a frequency. And I can't remember whether this was group A or so. Let's say the true value was about, say, 15 milligrams per milliliter. That was the true value. That is what the guy from the teaching hatch gave me. Protein, 
A, B, C, D, one of them was 15 milligram per milliliter. And when I plot this, what I see is that quite a large number of students got it pretty, pretty right. So high number here. Yeah. A few students were a little bit out. Even fewer students were a little bit out more. And I probably should do it like that as well. Some students get, got a little bit more. Some students got a little bit less. Something like that. Yeah? Ah. When I do that, when I comp co connect these data points, I get a very typical and a very common distribution. This distribution is a normal, it's called normal distribution because it's so, so common. Normal or standard distribution. And I guess you understand intuitively what this, what this normal or standard uh, distribution actually tells you. Most of them get it right. So this one here would be the mean. Is it actually a population or a, a sample? Population? Why? You're right, but why is it population? What do you think? Because I'm looking at all the results. I'm not just picking the results from these three students here. That would be a sample. But I'm picking all of the results. So this would be the mean, population mean. Not always do I have a standard, TV, uh, a standard distribution here. Can give you examples of actually of marking. When I do marking of exam papers, for example, I find sometimes this. So that's standard distribution. This is very typical for when I mark essays. Why is that? And, and here it is usually the, the population mean is about 62% that the students get in terms of marks. It's usually the essay is all right, is good, only a very few people get an absolutely amazing thing done. So they would get a first or better. Only a few people are completely, there's nothing there. So that, is, that indicates to me this is an essay question. Sometimes I see something like that. This is a binomial distribution, or by no, no, not binomial, bimodal, because we have two modes here, one mode here, one mode here. What do you think this indicates in terms of marks? How would you interpret this graph? What's the interpretation of this camel graph? Most common? Absolutely. There is a group of students who get it spot on. 
absolutely, they got it. And there's a group, group of students who just simply don't get it. Right? What could this be? The first one was an essay. The second one could be... Sorry? True or false quite type questions or problem-solving questions. Yeah? What do you think about this distribution? What happened here? And here we have, say, 100%. What happened here? Any suggestion? The question was too easy. Exactly. Whatever it was, the question was too easy. Basically, everybody got it right. This indicates it could mean the question was too easy or the teaching was too good. Right? Very often, by the way, in these quizzes, I have seen a distribution like that. So that means either the question was too easy or you really got it. Right? So what is so special about this normal distribution? I'll try to get it really nicely done. I'm not giving you the the equation for that, because we don't need to calculate the equation. But there is an equation for that. What is so special about it? Well, the special thing about the normal distribution is that it fulfills a, a number of criteria. First of all, the mean indicates the largest group, the largest frequency. And there's only one peak. It's only a monomodal distribution, not like the camel. I sometimes refer to that as the brontosaurus uh, distribution, but obviously that's terminologically it's wrong. Okay. First question. If you look at something like that, can you make a prediction about how much of your data are below the mean and how much of your data are above the mean? How much of your data are in this range? In percent. 50% of your data are below the mean and 50% are above the mean. That's the definition of a mean. Yeah? The next criterion for the standard distribution is that if you look at the standard deviation, you can draw standard deviations left and right of the mean. So here you would have plus one standard deviation and here you have minus one standard deviation. Yeah? In this range, plus and minus one standard deviation, roughly, so I do that, in this range, Roughly, 68% of your data are located. Plus, minus one standard deviation. 
68% of your data should be within this range. Make sense? Another characteristic of the normal distribution is that if you look at two standard deviations, two standard deviation here and plus two standard deviations. So in this range here, In this range here, you have 95% of your data. So two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean. And you should have 95% of your data. And last but not least, Three standard deviations in this range here, you have ninety nine point seven per cent of your data. Yeah, and this is what is called the empirical number or the empirical rule. It's the 68, 99.7% rule. And I want you to remember this uh, sort of almost like a phone number. 68, 95, 99.7. So what can we do with that? I can, for example, when I look at your grades for your practical in general, for example, it could be that it is a normal distribution. Something like that. This here should not go up. And let's say we have 65%. That is the mean. So I get all your grades, all your marks. Let's say it's 65. And I can also do the standard deviation let's say the standard deviation of that would be say 10 so that's one standard deviation here left and right Now, here's a question for you. How many students, and I want to try to work that out amongst yourself, how many students in percent, how many students have a score higher than 65%? Loud? 50? Who says 50? 50? Anyone else? 50? Yeah, 50%. So 50% have a score higher than 65%. Why? Because it is on the right-hand side of the mean. So that would be all these students here 
like that. And we said that's 50%. Fantastic. How many students have a score lower than 75%? How many students have a score lower than 75%? Anyone? How many students have a score lower than 75%? 84%. There was a question mark the way you, you, you said it. You think. Uh -huh. 84%. What, do you, what does the rest think? How do you get to 84%? So that's 50%. Yes. You are absolutely right. That's 50%. Bless you. This one here, in this area, we said one standard deviation away should contain 68%. Yeah? So what we need really is just this bit now. Does that make sense? So therefore, it's half of 68, and therefore, it's 34, this bit here. 50 at 34 gives you 84%. Yeah, well done. Right. 65, what did I say, 10. How many students how many students have achieved a score higher than 95? How many students have achieved a score higher than 95? What do you reckon? Any ideas? 0.3%. 0.3%. Is that right? <coughs> Is it right? You don't know. No? You say no? It's not right. Why, didn't you, why, why do you think it's not right? Say again. <laughs> you are absolutely right. You are on the right track. That increased the unit cost by more than 5% of the cost. Yeah. <laughs> I say it for you. 0.3%. Zero 0.3%, that's from this 99.7%. This is three, so 95 in this case, mark of 95. How many standard deviations is that away from the mean? Okay. It's three standard deviations away from the mean. So we would have 99.7%. So 99.7% are, uh, are outside that. So it's 0.3, as uh, Johan has said, 3%. But these 3% are either side. So there are a number of students who are below 5% and the same number of students who are above 95%. And together, this should be 0.3%.
So above 95%, we have a total of 0.15% students. 0.15% are higher than 95, and 0.15% are lower than 5%. Right? Does that make sense? Let's assume Let's assume What's your name with a with a cold? Megan. Megan. Let's assume Meg, um, Megan is a good student and Megan got say um 86%. Well done. Yeah? So Megan's score is 86%. I now want to, in a way, determine how many standard deviations is she away from the mean. And there's a very simple trick for that. And this is called the Z-score. And the Z-score is defined as the individual result, we call it X, minus the population mean, divided by the standard deviation. Yeah? So, can you quickly calculate the Z-score for Megan, please? What's the Z-score for Megan? What's the set score? 2.1. So Megan's set score would be, in this case, 2.1. This tells me that Megan is two and a little bit standard deviations better than the mean. That she resides in a range that only, how many students would have achieved that who are better than two standard deviations? Loud? 2.5% of the students have achieved this mean. 2.5 because we've got two standard deviations contain 95%. Yeah? But Megan is outside these 95% and she is on the, on the positive side. So it's 2.5 higher and 2.5 lower than the two standard deviations. So therefore, Megan is amongst the 2.5% top scoring students in this case. Excellent job. Yeah? Here's a question. Can the Z-score be negative? Yeah? How? Yep. So if I have, for example, a student who is not terribly bright, let's say that student X, student A, whatever, scores 20%, the mean is 65, and the standard deviation is 10. What do you get for the Z-score? Negative. 
So 20 minus 6, 65 divided by 10 gives you minus 4.5. So this student is four standard deviations lower than the class mean. It's probably um, a case for intervention. Does that make sense? Normal distribution is something absolutely beautiful. You can do lots of things with it. For example, when you are in the manufacturing uh, industry, and some of you will go into manufacturing, um, when you, for example, develop drugs, good drugs, I mean, and uh, so working for a pharma uh, company, you have to produce these tablets, for example, and they have very precise um, quality requirements. So, let's say your drug should on average contain 10 milligram of a substance. So that would be the average that all these drugs have. Your standard deviation should be 0 0.5 milligrams. That's 5%. Something that the FDA would not allow but just for simplicity, 0 0.5 milligram, that's the standard deviation. And now you take a sample and say, is my machine working properly? Is my production line working properly? So what would happen if I find a drug that has 10.3 milligrams? What is my set score of that? What's the set score? It's 0 0.6. So this tells me that if the FDA has set the Federal Drug uh, Association that approves all drugs, if the FDA has said your drug must be, your drug production must be within one standard deviation of the, uh, of the advertised value, you would be able to say, yes, I've checked, and this particular one is only 0.6% or is only 0.6 standard deviations away from the population means, so yes, we can sell it, yeah? So this normal distribution is something absolutely great, and because um, these normal distributions are so frequent, are so common, they are usually accepted as the distribution that we are working with. And everything that follows a normal distribution is called, also called a parametric distribution. Parametric. And what we can do is we can do what is called parametric tests on that. Parametric tests. So if you have a standard distribution, a normal distribution, you can use parametric tests. There are other distributions, like I showed you earlier, 
that do not follow a normal distribution. And therefore, common wisdom says that if it is a non-normal, abnormal, non-standard distribution, you cannot use parametric tests on them. The Z-score, in a way, Z-score is kind of a parametric test. Now, coming back to the, to the problem-solving marking that I showed you earlier, we have something like that. Is that normal distributed? Certainly not. Can you do a Z-score on that? Absolutely, definitely not. Simply because this is not a normal distribution. Yeah? We are going to do... We are going to deal predominantly with parametric distributions. I might show you one or two non-parametric distributions. Uh, one of them is, let's see how many of you have heard about that. Uh, let me think if I can, let me see if I can think of a non-parametric test. Any psychologists here who have done <coughs> A-level psychology? You have done it. Yep, I know. You? Example for a non-parametric test. Man with knee U test, exactly. A man with knee U test is a non-parametric test which basically does not look at the data as a continuum, what does it do? Forgot. Ah, forgot. Yeah. It actually gives ranks to data. Yeah? So I could, for example, do the following. If I have uh, marks for students, so the top student got 100%. The next student got 99, 98, uh, 89, uh, 75, and so on and so forth. Yeah? These are the marks of the students. Now, hopefully, this would show me a sort of a normal distribution, as it should be, and I can do parametric tests on it one of the classic tests that we are going to do will be a t-test. Yeah? But don't worry about it. The alternative is that I don't use these data as continuous data as the marks. I could rank the students. So this guy is top, second, third, fourth, fifth. Yeah? I give rank numbers to them. Now, obviously it would now be quite difficult, so this is the rank, it would be quite difficult to do an average. An average rank doesn't mean anything, right? I can't do a standard deviation on that. So if I have ranks, this would be a non-parametric test. If I use continuous data, so it could be uh, 99.3, 99.8, or something like that. If I have a continuum of data and it follows a normal distribution, then I can do parametric tests on it. And that would be a non-parametric test. So whenever I deal with data in a certain way, I have to be pretty certain that my data follow a normal distribution. If I am fairly certain that it's a normal distribution, 
then I can do a parametric test on it. If I don't know whether it's a normal distribution or whether it's absolutely clear that it's a not, a not a normal distribution, then I, strictly speaking, can't do uh, a parametric test. So, what you should have learned today, the take-home message is, very important is the distinction between sample with the statistics and a population with parameters. And a very common distribution is the normal distribution, which follows the criteria for a normal distribution, i.e. 50% of the data are below the mean, 50% are above the mean. 68% of the data are between one standard deviation. 95% of the data are between two standard deviations. And 99.7% of the data are between three standard deviations. Does that make sense? I think we leave it there. Um,